My name is Lee Youngblood. I'm the Executive Director of Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust. Mount Grace has been conserving land in the North Quabbin region since 1986 and we've helped hundreds of landowners to protect nearly 29,000 acres of land. We work in 23 towns and 10 of those towns are in the pipeline's path. In every one of those 10 towns there are projects that we've worked on that are uh, affected by the, the, the pipeline. So Mount Grace helps to conserve land. We own land. We monitor conservation restrictions that are uh, on private land and we also facilitate a lot of projects that end up being state land or town land. Uh, Mount Grace also is in, runs an, a statewide AmeriCorps program that places 21 AmeriCorps members at land trusts across the entire state from the Berkshires uh, to the North Shore and so we have partner land trusts across the whole state. In that sense we, we do work statewide. Mount Grace first heard about the Kinder Morgan pipeline from landowners that we've worked with in the past. They contacted us after representatives of Tennessee Gas came to their land and said they wanted to put a pipeline on it and wanted permission to survey. And when the landowners said, well, this is conservation land, they were told that that didn't um, have any relevance on whether the pipeline could go there or not. So they called Mount Grace, very concerned about that, and asked us if that was true. Well, because Mount Grace has never been involved in a pipeline uh, situation before, we had to do a lot of homework to find out, um, you know, what the con what the truth was about whether the conservation status of the of the land mattered. Um, because of course, the conservation land, uh, excuse me, the conservation status of the land matters a lot to these landowners, and that the mission of Mount Grace is to protect land and to encourage the stewardship of land. So when land is protected, well, that you know, that is something that happens at one point in time, but the stewardship is something that continues um, forever. We talk about doing permanent land protection, and that's what we tell the landowners, that's how we promote ourselves. We, we don't do temporary land conservation. Um, some people have heard of Chapter 61. It's a <coughs> property tax uh, classification status that gives a temporary 10-year conservation status to land. And that's one, one program where, that we use as an example of differentiating permanent land conservation and temporary land conservation. So it's easy to see that when, you know, maybe a year after the fact or five years later or 10 years later, the pipeline company is coming to the landowners and telling them that um, the permanent conservation status of their land uh, is irrelevant to the pipeline. So it turns out that eminent domain is the principle that can undo conservation. And that is a tool that pipeline companies rely on. Even though the Natural Gas Act says that they can't un use, un use eminent domain unnecessarily. So they can't have an, an unnecessary, or, uh, good way to say that. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the language says that they can't use eminent domain unnecessarily which is the reason that the pipeline company talks to landowners and they say, well, we want to come to an agreement with you because their uh, mandate is to negotiate an easement with landowners and then also with state agencies and municipalities. Landowners first started contacting Mount Grace in the winter, February, March, uh, with these questions when the pipeline representatives were approaching them. And so uh, we looked at the map and could see that um, the pipeline would enter Mount Grace's 23-town region in Montague and go all the way across it out uh, of Ashburnham. And in fact, those two towns, Ashburnham and Montague, are places where we hold conservation restrictions on privately owned land that's in, directly in the path of the pipeline. And so in Montague, which is, of course, to the west, um, that was on the Bitzer Farm, which is now owned by Lisa and Bob Adams. And so we, being very concerned, we knew that the at, at that time, in the winter and spring, the <coughs> Kinder Morgan was saying they wanted permission to survey. So Mount Grace hired um, noted land use attorney Michael Pill to defend the conservation land from the Department of Public Utilities. And we have a 33-page memo that's available on our website uh, to anybody to use uh, themselves or use with their attorney or they can contact Michael Pill. But what that memo did is outline that <coughs> until 
FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, gives eminent domain status to Kinder Morgan, they don't have it. They don't have eminent domain powers now. And so the conservation status and all the laws of the Commonwealth um, should be upheld you know, to the highest degree um, as long as possible. And so Michael Pill does a wonderful job of outlining that in his memo to say that landowners, not only do they um, have the right to prevent trespass, they um, have a, the right to keep others from cutting their, their trees, nobody can excavate on their land, they can't take soil samples, and this not only applies to conservation land, but to any landowner. And so that's why that memo is very helpful. In addition, it goes on to say that the Department of Public Utilities cannot give Kinder Morgan permission to violate a conservation restriction. And Kinder Morgan should not be asking landowners for permission to violate their conservation restrictions in those cases where there are conservation restrictions on the land. The memo that, the legal memo that Michael Pill put together applies to all landowners, whether their land is conserved or not conserved, and I would definitely recommend that landowners make use of it because they do have property rights and it's important to protect private property rights. So the, with, um, my shirt refers to Article 97, and Article 97 is a provision in the Massachusetts Constitution that was passed by Senator Robert Wetmore in the 70s. Because in the Massachusetts Constitution, since for a hundred years, it said that the people have the right to clean air and water and a clean environment. But what happens is that incrementally, some conservation land is unconserved. And I'm talking about public conservation land, town-owned land, uh, state-owned land that's dedicated to conservation has been unconserved to be used for other uh, public purposes. And so to slow that down, you can imagine an eastern part of the state where there's a higher population density, there's less land to go around, there's a nice open field, um, and folks need to build bigger schools. Conservation land is frequently the target for development, which led to, in the 70s, the uh, Article 97 of the Massachusetts Constitution. And it reads that not only do we have the right to clean air and water, but that the legislature can't undo conservation land without a two-thirds vote of both houses. And so that's a high bar intentionally set because it's a common practice to try to undo conservation land for other purposes. And it also speaks to, because Article 97 requires a two-thirds vote of the whole legislature, that means legislators that are not in the path of the pipeline are going to have to take a stand on this. And I would urge everybody watching to contact not just their legislator if they're in the path of the pipeline, but all the legislators in the Commonwealth and legislators of their family members and their friends across the state because there will be a time when they have to make that vote. So back to, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the access for surveying. So after Kinder Morgan received Michael Pill's 33-page memo, they actually stopped um, seeking permission to survey from landowners that said no. Some landowners that I've met uh, received five letters from Kinder Morgan saying, we've written to you before, we haven't heard back from you, if you don't give us permission to survey, we'll have to go to the Department of Public Utilities in Massachusetts to get authorization for access. Well, those letters have stopped. So I believe that they are doing surveys on landowners that did give permission and haven't rescinded their permission, but they've stopped going forward where they don't have that uh, explicit permission. But I believe that will, there will come a time when they'll be back um, we expect right now that they're going to file in September, this is September, with their preliminary application, their pre-application to the uh, FERC. Even when they apply, they still don't have the power of eminent domain. And so it's important for landowners to remember their, their property rights and that they don't have permission to, for access to survey um, until eminent domain is granted. So I, I believe that we'll be seeing more, um, that this question about access um, for surveying will, will, will rise back up. Private property owners or land, land has a lot of uh, rights associated with the ownership. So we were talking before that even if your land is not conserved, you can prevent trespassing and prevent people from stealing your trees or your soil. Uh, then if there are conservation protections, there are a lot of different kinds of conservation protections. There are conservation restrictions. There are uh, charitable trusts, for example, donor restrictions. When 
the property where we are today, Skyfields Arboretum, was donated to Mount Grace for use as an arboretum. So it has to remain in its conservation status because when the donor, um, Peggy Biggs, gave it to Mount Grace, that was her restriction. And so many pieces of public or nonprofit conservation land have donor restrictions that create a legal charitable trust that can't just be unbroken. You, there's a, a whole body of law that talks about you have to go to the court to get that charitable trust undone. So that's, that's in addition to conservation restrictions. So there are many layers of conservation protection. Sometimes um, funding sources require you, we'll give you some money to help conserve the land, um, but it has to be used to conserve the land and not for any other purpose. So those funds have have ties to them that are related to conservation. So I would urge all landowners and all interested people to look at every single parcel of land that's slated in the pipeline's path and look deeply at how many layers of conservation um, protection are on that land and, and use them all. And so ultimately, um, eminent domain is primarily granted through the FERC permit. So that means when they get, um, we hear when, when Kinder Morgan and Tennessee Gas Pipeline get their certificate of public convenience and necessity, that gives them eminent domain power. They then have to go to court to negotiate a price for taking the land or the easement. Um, unless there are uh, streamlined mechanisms that are put into place by FERC. So sometimes they can, there's an expedited process of allowing the pipeline to go through an eminent domain to allow access by the pipeline even before the payment to the landowner has been agreed upon. So that's something to look out for. There's also something called a preliminary determination uh, that you know we have to look mo into more because um, basically preliminary determination of eminent domain is something that I haven't read much about, but I assume that means that during the application process there may be uh, some preliminary eminent domain status. Um, so that's something that requires further investigation, but primarily the Article 97 protection, which is for state land, our state forests and parks, our state wildlife management areas. Once the FERC permit is granted and the eminent domain status uh, power is given to the, to the pipeline company, then our Constitution no longer matters. Uh, Article 97 will no longer protect the land, but, but because of that provision of the Natural Gas Act that says they can't unnecessarily use eminent domain, they plan, they have to bring it to a vote of the legislature so that they're not perceived by FERC to be using it unnecessarily, to be using too heavy of a hand. And so it's important that our legislators not undermine our Constitution by voting to say that it's okay. Um, because even if they, if they vote no, Kinder Morgan can still go to FERC and ask for their certificate of public convenience and necessity. Um, but it won't look very good <laughs> if, if the whole legislator has voted against it. If, on the other hand, they can say, well, there is Article 97, we asked for a two-thirds vote and we got it. Um, you know, we've just given in too soon. The community organizers that want to stop the pipeline have uh, a lot of information and they have a list of all of the parcels that are in the, in the proposed path. Of course, we know the, the proposed path may move, but the 1,600 parcels that are talked about by Kinder Morgan, um, we know who those landowners are and we know how many pieces of conservation land there are. Um, for example, the main stem of the pipeline, I believe, is 126 miles of the main trunk across the whole Commonwealth from Richmond to Drake. It. 32 of those miles cross conservation land that has some status or the other state. Just in Mount Grace's region alone, in these 10 towns, that many conserved areas are be going to be directly affected, including the Lawton State Forest, the Ashburnham State Forest, um, sanctuaries of Mass Audubon, the um, town conservation land, um, and also um, a lot of private conservation land that was paid for with public funds, either state funds or federal funds. Mm -hmm. So the land is privately owned but is protected with a public restriction along the lines of a state agricultural preservation restriction.
Some landowners have conservation restrictions that they've been paid by the Commonwealth because their land is important and serves a public benefit, which is why the state has spent you know, millions of dollars to conserve um, land across the state, which is completely uh, being going to be compromised by, by this um, so-called public purpose. Skyfields Arboretum, where Mount Grace's offices are, are on Old Keene Road in Athol, which is adjacent to the Lawton State Forest, which was the first project that Mount Grace did in 1986 that the community supported um, very broadly. And the, the Lawton State Forest is uh, slated to be affected by the pipeline at its northern, northernmost edge. To the west of here, before it gets here, it'll go right through Tully. Uh, Little Tully Mountain is not conserved, but it's right where, you know, just across the street from Tully Mountain after it comes down, you know, from North Orange. Uh, the landowners who contacted us in the beginning to tell us about this were very concerned. I mean, in many cases, they were protecting land that had been in their family for generations, and it was their honor and their duty to conserve that land during their ownership and but it was something that had been important to their family for generations and many of these uh, parcels of land have been you know these are rural properties and rural landowners and families and rural histories where the land has been farmed or forested you know that's that's uh, backbreaking work a lot of uh, blood sweat and tears has gone in into this land which is the reason that these landowners are conserving their land and it's the reason that uh, Mount Grace and myself were here to help them is to protect land that they care about. And so to have that land compromised by a pipeline that has been demonstrated to not even be necessary is so uh, insulting and such an affront and that's the reason that Mount Grace is doing what we can to bring attention to this matter. You know, we re Mount Grace relies on the research of the Conservation Law Foundation and other organizations or other similar organizations, and they've demonstrated through very careful research that our energy needs can be met without this pipeline. Our energy needs can be met without compromising conservation land that's important to all of us. The clean air and clean water and healthy food that we all need to survive comes from the land.